Susan, I don't know about you, but I'm worried about cyber. We've got 20 billion devices connected to the internet, only 7 billion people on Earth, enormous threat surface. You're one of our nation's experts. How worried are you? I'm really worried, actually, and I'm a lot more worried since the election mm. because we didn't think of the threat to the civilian sector, to civil society, and that's a threat that's much harder to protect against than critical infrastructure. We sort of have mental models for how we might do the latter, but not the former. And in that regard, um, and I'm with you, I literally lay awake at night worrying, in my case, about the electric grid, the security of our nuclear weapons. You look very broadly at this as well. Are we prepared to deal with these kind of challenges? I don't think we've thought through the diplomatic, the, the policy responses at all. We have technical capabilities, but that's upping the ante, and I don't think we've come to that set of decisions yet. What strikes me as so powerful about your work is the way you've crossed the bridge um, between policy and technical. Um, how important is that to solving these cyber problems? I think it's really important to have some people who can cross that bridge mm -hmm. um, because you want people, whether in industry or in government, to be able to have reasoned responses. They don't have to know all the details of a technical protocol. They don't need to know all the nuances of our North Korea policy. They need to know enough to be able to start asking the right questions of the experts who do. Mm -hmm. And that really involves sophistication on both sides. Susan, in the Navy, one of our biggest heroes in the world of cyber was a woman who became a rear admiral named Grace Hopper. Sure. And whenever I think of Grace Hopper, who came along through that track in the 50s and 60s and 70s, to really convince the Navy that cyber mattered, I think about the need for women in cyber. Obviously, something that has been a big part of your life is facing the challenges of gender in a discipline that has not always been accommodating. How do we get more women involved? Are we improving in that regard? We've gotten worse, actually. We were better in the 60s and 70s than we are now, and part of it seems to be computer games. It's not clear why all of it happened. Um, part of it, I think, involves if you take the introductory programming course and you split out the kids who've had some programming, even a tiny bit, from the rest, then you encourage more women and also minorities, which are also quite underrepresented. The other thing to do is to think about putting applications that are more socially oriented. Mm -hmm. um, when you pull in applications that deal more with people rather than things, you tend to attract more women. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, then healthy because you create engineers who think about the world in a much broader fashion. Yeah. Well, it's obvious to observe it, but I will anyway, that we can't solve 100% of the world's problems with 30% of the world's population or 50%. Right. We need everybody, and I think women in computer science are crucial for us, just like they are in everything else we do. Um, speaking of entities that can help us face these challenges, what do you think the government could be doing better to help our nation be cyber secure? So the government could clean up its own house. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the problems with government cybersecurity is that typically funding is for buying machines rather than for maintenance. And the idea that maintenance is important is, is one piece. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has been doing better about providing useful guidance. But we could do more. We could have, we could start thinking about long term how you might introduce liability in, in certain kinds of issues with software. Mm -hmm. How you might go from a model that says, this is what you must do, which provides a floor, to doing things like a tax and thinking about how do you check the security of systems by what we call red teaming and actually attacking systems and providing models for companies. Yeah, I, I do believe that private-public cooperation is crucial to solving the cyber problems. It's a different kind of bridge than we were talking about a moment ago, but I, I think an equally important one. Um, let me close on the importance of cyber hygiene, as it's often called. In the government and in the military, we find about 70 percent of all breaches are the result of simply bad 
attention to detail on everything from passwords to where you poke your thumb drive to how often you change your hardware, how often you do the upgrades. Um, say a word about how important that is. Oh, it's absolutely critical. So for example, on my personal machine, on the machines I have at Tufts, I've set up two accounts. I have a sysadmin account that I'm in charge of and my own account. And I do all my work on the, my own account. When I have to do an upgrade or install something, I do it on the sysadmin account. That reason for that, it's annoying. It's an extra password. It's an extra step. But it pauses me. It makes me stop and think. And that's crucial. Uh, second factor authentication, which is something that Tufts recently instituted for everybody, is great. And the fact that Tufts is using something from Duo, which it provides a very usable interface, is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, using, I think about passwords, and when I use my passwords, I have passwords that I don't care about that are very low value, that I don't pay much attention to. Then I have passwords for accounts that matter, and I grade them mentally in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, I write them down on a piece of paper that is carefully stored, mm -hmm. but I don't have it anywhere else. Yeah. Um, one other... One other uh, question I wanted to ask you was whether or not in your personal uh, use of devices and so on, you use biometrics extensively and whether you think biometric um, analysis as in um, using everything from thumb to retina is part of cybersecurity. So I teach a lot of privacy and I think a lot about privacy. I don't, I'm not particularly worried about the government, the U.S. government coming after me, but I decided when I was teaching a privacy course a few years ago that if I was going to teach about this material, I actually had to use the, the, the software, the hardware. And so I, I no longer use just my, thumb, my, my fingerprint uh, for opening my iPhone. I use a pin code as well because that's what I would suggest to any human rights worker, any journalist, anybody doing business intelligence, anybody who has a reason to want to be private. And, and so that's the first thing I think about when I think about biometrics, is that the government, a government, has the right to get that information from you, and some governments are not like ours, where they don't get it under the, the power of law. So that's the risk I see with biometrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to conclude, um, any last uh, observations or thoughts you want to offer on cybersecurity? So I'm thrilled to be at Tufts, but I'm particularly thrilled at, at being in a position where I'm joining together policy and technology, and at least the courses I'm offering right now are going to be cross-listed. Not all of them can be, because some of them will have too much of a technical component, some of them will be too advanced policy-wise, perhaps, but, but, but joining the students together, they learn a lot from each other, and when you mix the groups, that's great. So I'm, I'm thrilled that, that, that Tufts has come up with this plan, because I think it's really too great. Yeah, as I would say, policy wonks and people who know how to code. What a combination. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, Susan. Sure.